What's up, Hyperfast Nation? On this episode of the podcast, I sat down with a real estate investor and social media influencer. He started just seven years ago, has already built up two different companies, one that owns 40 million in rental property and another one that's doing 300 wholesales and flips per year. Welcome to the show, Sam Prim. What's up, Sam? Welcome to the show today. I'm doing well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm excited to get you in front of our audience on the podcast, do some longer form content here. I've seen so much of your content on short form platforms like IG Reels, TikTok. So going a little deeper is going to be fun. Before we do that, though, why don't you give our listeners a little bit of your background, who you are, what you do, that kind of that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, long form is uh, is probably what you don't know me as. So if my answers are too short, it's because I'm used to short form. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'll probably blab on too long. Um, so yeah, uh, appreciate the introduction. My name is Sam. I'm, I'm a real estate investor. I kind of took that path from, um, you know, school to full-time job to side hustle of real estate to, you know, full-time investor to financial free. So that kind of path of the general, you know, what everybody, the path that society takes you, tells you to take, I've kind of taken that, but took a little bit of a left turn and, you know, went into real estate. So currently I'm sitting at a $40 million rental portfolio that I bought um, using other people's money. And then I also own a house buying company here in St. Louis that we're going to uh, flip about 300 houses this year. So I am actively in the real estate investing space and actively using um, other people's money to grow my wealth and their wealth. So you kind of do all elements and you've got you've got the recurring income play with the rental portfolio, the you know, hopefully big chunks of liquidity to time play with that flipping business and then you're putting fuel into both of those by effectively using other people's money. Yep, I don't know if I could have worded it better. Exactly, you got the active income with the, the flipping and the wholesaling, and then the long term uh, long term wealth with the rentals. Because I think you know most people probably know you're not going to get you know super wealthy off of rentals right away. At least it's not it's a it's a long term passive game, not a short term active game. So we got a lot that we can jump into uh, with what you're doing now and how that how that might kind of change or adapt during the little the turmoil we're getting in the market right now but before we do that tell people how'd you get started you know you had the full-time job why did you decide to start playing around with real estate and then how did it grow into something that allowed you to quit your job that you i'm guessing probably didn't like that much <laughs> Yeah, um, so I just started to invest in the side. So I've always kind of had an entrepreneurial itch. Um, me and my buddy Lucas, who owns all this stuff that um, I talked about, I'm going to talk about, we own it together. We did, had a painting business in college. You know, we painted exteriors of houses. We we tried to be bookies for a little bit in college. We always kind of tried to make some extra money and, and do our do our own thing. And you have a little more control, kind of be your own boss. That whole narrative just always seemed fun. And growing up playing sports and being competitive, having a job even that you do well and then like, okay, it's just you can only grow so much or only make so much money. Kind of having that competitive bet on yourself, unlimited ceiling is the exciting thing about being an entrepreneur. So I started to, I feel like, do it kind of strategically. I bought a, a rental in 2015. One, one house, uh, bought a couple that next year and just kind of started to scale and figure it out and screw up and learn and always had my W-2 income and, you know, credit or whatever you want to back to fall back on if things went south. And luckily, they never really did too bad. And then eventually, I felt like I had enough rentals built up. I had enough pipeline of, you know, flips and wholesales that I've been working on in the pipeline and just enough relationships that I had built that I felt like it was okay to quit my job because I was, I was making pretty good money and, and I liked it okay. I didn't hate it. I just didn't like it as much as what my side hustle had become. So then I felt like I strategically took that leap. It wasn't like one of those things where you jump in the pool whether there's water in there or not head first. I kinda I kinda knew a little bit and had some, you know, some feel for what was gonna be on the other side. I think the cool thing in all of that is the time it took, right? You said 2015, first deal, now 2022, you're flipping 300 homes a year, $40 million rental portfolio. People, I think, sometimes 
think it's going to take a lifetime or think they can't do it. Or on the other end of the extreme, they like try it for three months and they're like, oh, it didn't work. Right. So, you know, you kind of hit that sweet spot and are just a good example of, you know, it takes, it takes a little time to build, but it doesn't take your whole lifetime or even 10 years. Exactly. No, I, three years about is what it took me to be able to quit my job. And then after I quit my job is when things really, really expanded. I, I learned a lot and created some systems and processes and made the right connections and honestly got over the whole debt is, you know, worrying about being in debt as long as you're buying, you know, assets to produce cash and grow in value, keep doing it. So yeah, you're right. It doesn't take that long. I tell people, you know, grind for the next five so you can enjoy the next 50. You know, it really does. That five years is a really good barometer for somebody that's going to work really hard and follow the, the road map and, you know, actually put effort into it and not, you know, kind of half-ass it, pardon my French. You know, if they're really going to give it their all, five years, you know, even on the side is, is a pretty good a pretty good amount of time. And I think a lot of people are, are going to hit that if, if that's what they want. It doesn't take 20, it doesn't take 30, but it also doesn't take six months. I feel like a lot of people um, you know think it's gonna happen right away and they give up I feel like that's one of the biggest reasons um, for whatever success I've had is you know not giving up and continuing to push through I'm sure we'll get into social media that's a huge thing with social media is just not giving up and I'm sure with your podcast too it takes a while to get traction and then then you really start to see the results I hear so many quotes and try to be philosophical on my Instagram stories and mm. so one of the biggest things that hits me and obviously then I'll stop blabbing is that the whole the whole thought process or quotes or, you know, mottos that I see, you know, successful people aren't special. The only reason they're special is because they convince themselves they're not. They do the same thing over and over and over again. And 90% of people stop because they haven't seen results, but successful people just keep going without results. They just, they don't give up. And then eventually the results are there, but that six months or two months or, you know, three years of not really seeing immediate results is the reason most people quit and is the reason most people are successful because they don't stop it. It's really that simple. Honestly, it's most successful. People aren't any smarter than people that aren't. So you put in the three years, then you were able to quit your job and then you saw massive growth and scaling. What allowed that, that big, uh, you know, jump up three years in. Yeah. The, uh, uh, couple things one of it was and i'm not usually this type of guy one of this was the mindset you know my original goal was 25 million real estate by 2025 and then you know that was my original goal. my original goal was one house a year for 10 years and then it grew and grew and goals grew and grew and then 25 million by 2025 or by the time yeah by 2025 and now we're at 40 million i think we'll be well over 50 at the end of the year now the goal is a billion in real estate and the goal is to bring an nba team to st louis so we've Figure it out not to set short goals. We set crazy ass goals and who knows if we'll get to them or not. So I think that's part of it. A is having the mindset and like truly believing that I thought a hundred million was a stupid goal in real estate and maybe even in a couple of years and I'll be before I'm 40, probably be there. So the goal is now a billion in real estate, an NBA team. So that's the one part of it. And the other part of it is it takes time to develop relationships. Like I went through so many banks at first that I said no or i didn't like working with or they didn't like work with me for whatever reason but over those three years you know before i quit i i had two or three really strong relationships with small local banks that have funded so much of what i've done since then and then also built a relationships with private lenders and hard money lenders you know the funding sources and then you know took those years to build relationships with contractors and to build relationships you know with agents and wholesalers to bring me deals and marketing you know on point so those first few years a lot of experimenting and then once everything I felt like was kind of all right let's just you know turn the dial now that everything's kind of dialed in just turn the dial up that's really what it was it was just you know trial and error and building relationships uh it was a huge part of it what are your deal boxes now let's let's kind of break them into two right so you you got the multifamily passive income if you want to call it that box and then you've got the flipping box um what do you look for in each of those boxes? How do you fund them? And then what's the target result on each of them? Yeah, so the active stuff, so the, the fix and flips and the wholesales, 
I just say flipping. Um, so I guess the, we'll make that clear. Flipping, you know, buying and selling. You know, a majority of those we're going to wholesale. Those 300 houses we're going to do those this year. You know, well over 200 we're going to wholesale, and the rest will be fix and flip. So for that company, you know, it, it's quick. It's either wholesaling or you know doing a quick rehab and selling. If it's if it's a huge rehab, then we're going to just wholesale it. We like to say under fifty thousand dollars on our rehabs is just a lot less can go wrong. A lot less with the project, the market. A lot of things can can go wrong, but a lot less will go wrong in a short period of time in general. Real estate's a big, real, the real estate market's a big ship. It doesn't like turn on a dime. It's a slow turner. So, and you can usually still see, you know, see signs and make adjustments. So for that company, it's, you know, much more open. We're all in St. Louis area. So we only, we only buy and invest here. The real estate market's so freaking ginormous that I think, you know, we're the biggest house buyer in St. Louis. And I think we're 5% of mm -hmm. the off market deal. So there's just so much, even in St. Louis, you know, not the most exciting big city. So for that, you know, we'll pretty much buy anywhere if we don't like it uh, the deal it's somewhere we don't want to rehab or you know it's too big for rehab we'll wholesale it the rest you know we'll kind of flip ourselves so that that's pretty open and rentals I got uh, 136 single family rentals six um, apartment complexes and a few self storage facilities and those are we're a little pickier on those are somewhere we want to be in a B class area I like the the B class meaning, you know, A is super high end, B is, you know, good middle, hard working, you know, middle class, C is, you know, maybe a little more landlord um, type houses and then D and, D and F we stay away from. But that B class you in St. Louis, you get decent appreciation, house value growth, and you get decent cash flow. So that is the best of both worlds. You're not getting $800 a month cash flow, but you're getting, you know, two, three, four hundred $400 a month cash flow. And, you know, your properties are, are going up at four or 5% a month, a, a year in value, not take this crazy inflation aside. So that's the middle ground we like to be in for our, um, for our rentals, whether it be single family or multifamily, just those, you know, decent areas. And our multifamilies are actually maybe a little bit more A areas. They're a little bit, you know, higher end areas that, you know, we want to just keep a good client, a good tenant base in there because, you know, for multis, I feel like it's sometimes a little bit harder to get a good tenant base, but if you're in that higher end properties, it, it's not. Hold that thought for a second. Did you know I've been involved in developing and building hundreds of homes? And did you know that we take partner investors in our deals? If you want to learn about new opportunities that we have for real estate investors, go to my Instagram account, it's the Dan Lesniak, and send me a direct message. Again, if you want to learn about my next opportunities for real estate investor partners, go to my Instagram at ddanlesniak and send me a direct message. How do you find the deals, both, both boxes? So we're a little unique, I guess, compared to some. So I'm in a few masterminds and know some of the other uh, bigger uh, house investors across the country in most states and in most big cities. And most of them just spend a crap ton of money on marketing. We don't do that. Our approach is more networking based, more connection based. So of those 300 houses we're going to buy this year, probably 200 of them are going to be from zero dollars in marketing spend so that's we have five full-time buyers their jobs are to network 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 they talk to wholesalers and real estate agents and you know insurance agents and elder law attorneys and you know their network and you know we buy a few houses a year from a bowling alley owner just people that know a lot of people we connect with and life happens when we invest in properties and you i'm sure as well it's a distressed property and the reason they're selling it, especially in today's market, is because they need to sell it quick and there's an issue. So we just need to be around people that are around a ton of people. And when life happens, they know to contact us. So you kind of need to be famous in your circle as far as real estate investing goes. So that's a majority of our leads. And that's how we bought all of our apartment complexes, I guess, except one have been through you know networking and getting to know brokers and things like that. And then we do spend money on marketing, not a ton, um, like 30 to 40 grand a month. So a decent amount, but not really for how many houses we buy. And, you know, we do, we do, we just got into TV. That's a majority of that. It's kind of a brand building play. And we've done Facebook ads and paper clicks, and we do a decent amount of direct mail, some driving for dollars, just the general things that most people think of. We just are consistent with it, you know, just because you didn't get any results or not very many results from your last two mailings, you still got to send it again. You can't give up. So consistency and networking and uh, marketing has been key for us. What kind of changes, if any, are you making right now with what we're seeing in the market? Higher interest rates, inventory creeping up a little, things aren't flying off the market in some areas anymore. What, what kind of changes are you doing to your approach? 
So we're definitely making a few changes, not a ton though, especially in St. Louis, we're pretty insular. And I, you know, like I said, I've in a few networking things with people around the country. I know San Diego specifically and Arizona, those are getting hit a little bit harder right now, which is typical. So the market is shifting. Uh, I 100% agree with you, but I have a little more, a little less, um, you know, I guess recency bias. When I started in 2015, you know, we did a few flips probably in maybe not till 2016, but the goal was to sell the house in 30 days. And that was from 2015 to 2019. That's what we did, you know, 30 days to sell a house. That's fine. Great house, you know, maybe a price drop and then you sell it. That's like normal. The, all this stuff recently, the 20 offers or 50 offers or 30% over asking, that is completely abnormal. So a retraction from that is a good thing and it's a retraction to the norm. But the people that have this recency bias of, oh my gosh, my house has been on the market for two weeks, the market's crashing because they watch CNN and Fox News and clickbait people on YouTube, I won't name any names, but they just see fringe things and they think the market's crashing and it's just not the case. So I'm not adjusting a ton, especially here in St. Louis. We're pretty, you know, in 2008 to 11, I think we dropped like 14% in St. Louis. So it wasn't near as drastic. So luckily my market's good for that. We're buying a little bit deeper. Some of our buyers that buy our stuff are a little more conservative right now. So we're buying a little bit deeper, maybe keeping a few more rental properties uh, than we normally would just to make sure to keep that machine going. We buy off of ourselves in the flipping company. So not a ton of changes, buying a little bit deeper and keeping an eye on the market, but trying to not overreact, I guess. I guess I could say if I was in Arizona or Phoenix, maybe my answer would be different, but I'm not. All right. Well, uh, your approach looks very thoughtful and, you know, local base, which you have to be how switching gears a little bit how has social media helped fuel your business and what you do because I, I see your stuff all over TikTok, ig reels so when did you start to go heavy on social media and and what has that done for your business yeah for sure love that question so i'd say in 2018-19 um my business part, Lucas, like I mentioned, and I, we started posting a little bit on Facebook about what we were doing. You know, we each had full-time jobs, so we weren't, I guess we just had quit our jobs, but we weren't like super active in social media at all. We did a few things and started to post and got a lot of traction, at least locally, you know, you know, a bunch of people commenting and sharing and asking, asking us questions, high school buddies. I didn't know you in real estate, so, you know, it was kind of fun and cool. and We helped a few people. So then 2020 uh, and COVID hit and, you know, the everyone kind of shut down and I don't remember, it doesn't really matter. I don't remember if I heard it or somebody said it or I just thought it. I thought it was a good time to get in that social media space. People are just going to be on their computers and TVs and phones because they're not going to be as active. So I decided to um, kind of go a little bit harder into social media. I didn't know what that was going to become. I created the Faster Freedom brand in you know, mid-2020. So this you know whole social media thing is only a couple years old now. And I started to create content and then through that created, you know, a mentorship and a few other things. So it's, it's helping me there. The brand is bringing in people. I'm making a little bit of money off social media, but growing a brand that's becoming, I think, valuable. And I, you know, it's a funnel for the mentorship that I have for people. It hasn't really affected the, uh, you know, the deal side as much because it's, that's not what it's for. It's, it's a national audience. I only buy locally, you know, I have a decent local audience, but we've probably gotten a few deals from it, but I'm not syndicating and buying these huge apartments across the country yet. So it hasn't really helped with that, but it was more of just a, let's get some eyeballs on me and then we'll figure out, you know, how to monetize them down the line. And that's kind of what we've been figuring out the past six months. What kind do of you an opportunity think I saw, I guess. What, what kind of advice would you give to people that want to start using social media to grow their influence, grow their brand, you know, feed their business? Like what kind of content do they need to make and what should their overall approach be? Yeah. So I would, I would take a step back. So if you want to get into social media space, I love it. It's still not saturated people, like some people think it is because there's these huge names, but you know, I think 99% of people on social media consume 1% create. So there's, you know, there's still a, a need for it and it's so easy to do all you need your phone. My 1.7 million TikTok followers are literally every single thing's been on my phone, um, just me recording and you know, usually me editing. So it, you don't need this entire production studio, especially on TikTok. So I, I would like take a step back and look at your goals. If your goal is to grow a local brand so you can get a deal flow, I would focus on Facebook and Instagram and Meetup. If your goal is to build a national brand, um, I would focus more on maybe like uh, TikTok and YouTube and Instagram. You know, 
either way, I would do TikTok, I guess, local or national, because it's such a potential like infusion of views. But if you want to be local and grow that brand, you know, I would definitely still do TikTok, but Facebook and, and meetups and be involved in the groups and start a Facebook group or start a meetup. If you're wanting national, for sure, TikTok and then YouTube and then maybe this podcast space that you're in. I'm, get, I'm launching a podcast here in two weeks. Um, so I would look at that, you know, specific by social media and you can always repurpose this. The short term stuff you can always repurpose. You don't have to, um, you know, create specific content for each app. I do a little bit, but in general, you can create a 30 second video they can use on YouTube shorts, on reels, on LinkedIn if you want, on TikTok, on Facebook, on, on everything you want. So I would do that. Um, so those are the two. I would start with those. And then as far as creating content, just do it every single day. You're not going to get views at first and don't try to overdo it. People can relate to you trying to find your first deal better than, than they can relate to me or you probably. So they maybe watch our stuff because they're like, oh, that's cool. But as far as relating and building a connection, it's really easy to do when you're new and, and young and you know fresh to the whatever you're going to be creating content on. So just be you, be authentic. Don't get discouraged if it takes you a month to get a first video to get 100 views but consistently do it and improve on it Monday morning quarterback each video and and you will start to get traction for sure hey hold that thought for a minute are you a real estate agent in the DMV area or thinking about becoming a real estate agent in the DMV area why not join the highest selling team in the DMV the Carrie Scholl team is hiring more agents we have the best training systems the best culture and the best environment to get you to the next level, whether that's starting out and getting to six figures or getting from six figures to 250 or to half a million or even beyond. Go to carryshawcareers.com. Again, that's carryshawcareers.com. Yeah, I like that idea if you're starting out of just documenting the journey, sharing with people what you're trying to do, the challenges, and then, you know, when, when the first one works, right? I, I think there's power in that and, and a lot of people that started five ten years ago before social media was really big probably would love if they could go back and look and watch that out of themselves right so so that is an advantage that i think someone starting off today has yeah i, th I think so too and having just the ease used to have to have a a camera crew following you around, right? The Kardashians are kind of the first people to be famous for doing nothing. Well, I mean, Kim did something, but anyways, they're like the first ones that were famous for, um, <laughs> were famous for, um, you know, just having like normal life and following you around. You don't need that. You can use your phone for it. You can do, you can just be you. And that's what people like. That's what reality shows are. They're people just living their normal lives and, you know, having your phone and being able to document it. I can't imagine some of these bigger names, you know, these people that were famous if they had social media back in the day and like following their journey. It'd be super cool to see and what it's going to be like in 30, 40 years when all these people that have blown up, you can see their journey. So I think it's going to be really cool and it's going to continue to be even more and more of a, you know, gold mine. All right, Sam. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Before we wrap up, I always like to do a hyper fast round if you are ready for some rapid fire Q&A. Let's do it. All right. What's your biggest piece of advice to a new real estate investor? Join your local community. Get involved in your meetups and Facebook groups. What's a mistake you see experienced investors making? They get overconfident. They think that they can't fail because the market's been at their back for so long that you know they're, they're not going to make a mistake, and they do. What's the biggest challenge you've had in real estate, and what did you learn from it? Uh, the biggest, I guess, mistake we made was we lost $150,000 because I forgot to put insurance on a... Um, building that we were building for our self storage facility. And I learned to put insurance on buildings that you build. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, what's something you're doing in your business now that you weren't doing six months ago? It's a good one. Um, I am starting to hire out more things on the social media and the uh, content side. It's always been just me creating everything, but in order to get to the next level, I need better production, better quality, better lighting and more help. All right, last one. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? 10 years from now, hopefully several hundred million in real estate owned, a bigger brand, and helping more people create financial freedom by following my path. All right, well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Sam. Before we sign off, if people want to connect with you, how should they do that? I know you mentioned the podcast is coming soon, so make sure you tell them about that and any other ways that 
they can connect with you? Yeah, just on all your social medias, um, at Sam Faster Freedom is my handle. Um, so TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, you know, at Sam Faster Freedom, I got on the 10th of August, have a podcast coming out. So just, just be in tune with my social media. And if you want to get a hold of me, send me a message on Instagram. There's a ton of fake accounts. So there's only one, the only one that I have a, a, right now, 160 something thousand followers. So the, all the little ones that buy followers, they, they'll message you. So just the at Sam Faster Freedom, no misspellings, message me. I'll send you training and or let you know what's going on. But I'm the one that answers my questions and answers my DMs still. So just hit me up there and whatever question you have, I'll answer. I'll point you in the right direction. That's probably the easiest path. All right, Sam, thank you so much for being on the show today. To all of our listeners and viewers, thank you for tuning in. Please remember to share this episode with other people that you think would benefit from Sam's great lessons as well. We will see you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure and go to hyperfastagent.com to learn about upcoming in-person and online events. And don't forget to share this show with someone that you think could benefit from hearing it and make sure you subscribe on YouTube or anywhere that you can find podcasts. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Hyper Fat Show. Subscribe to us if you want to make sure you get the latest and greatest Hyper Fat Shows. And remember, we love reviews. Reviews help us bring better and better guests and improve our shows. So give us the good, the bad, and the ugly. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed that video, and if you want to see more, click right here. And if you want 100 real estate tips from my best-selling book, click right here to download them instantly. And if you're new to this channel, click below to subscribe.